Succes veterinær praksis, podcast nummer 94. Dyrlæge Søren Pejstrup her. Velkommen til. Hvis du arbejder i smådyrspraksis, så vil du uden tvivl på et eller andet tidspunkt få en patient ind, uanset om du har bedt om at få den eller ej. Nogle kan vi måske sende videre uden at se dem ved at afvise dem i telefonen og sende dem direkte videre til specialisterne. Og andre, de dukker bare op, og så må vi håndtere dem. Og det er det, dagens podcast handler om. Hvilke ting, vi skal være opmærksom på, og hvilke ting, vi kan gøre ved de her patienter med lavt blodtryk. Skal vi hælde væske på, blod på, eller plasma eller hvad skal vi bruge til dem? Alt det kommer vi omkring i dag. Der er fart på, og det er en lidt længere episode, så det handler om at få spændt sikkerhedsdelen. Der er selvfølgelig altid, ligesom altid, links og noter over på hjemmesiden, så der kan du måske få nogle af detaljerne frisket op, hvis det går lidt for stærkt. Garrett, jeg har snakket med i dag, han er meget passioneret, og det kommer også godt igennem her i podcasten. Men det giver typisk også nogle af de bedste episoder, når folk de virkelig går op i deres emne. Så det bliver bare rigtig godt. Links og noter til dagens afsnit er på sivp.dk-94, og så over til interviewet. So, hi, Garrett, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's very kind of you to, to show up, uh, even now the, the Apple is uh, running the big <laughs> re- uh, release, and, and we, we two uh, sit here and talk to each other, but uh, I guess we're going to have to catch the replay. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll we'll find the uh, blogs and tweets and all the summaries. It's probably a better use of my time to read the summaries than spend two hours watching uh, Tim Cook tell me about all their new devices anyway. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Um, so, uh, Garrett, I've been following um, the Vet uh, Girl on the Run uh, blog for some time, and in that, of course, you uh, you have a, a big hand in that. So, um, I do uh, see some of your content. Uh, but can you please give us a, a Cliff Notes version of uh, who you are and, and what you uh, use your time on? Of course, happy to. So my name is Garrett Pachtinger. I'm a board-certified critical care specialist. Uh, I practice just outside of the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area. So I'll talk about vet girl in a little bit, but I'm also a practicing clinician. And I think that's really important for what you and I do in a sense where Uh, I'm in the trenches like everybody else. I'm practicing medicine. I see the cases come in uh, versus somebody who just stands up here in that proverbial lecture space and tells you what I know and what to do. I'm there with you in the trenches. I'm seeing these cases. We're going to talk about hypotension today. And I, I'm seeing these cases. I see hypotension. I work through those cases. And so as a clinician, I'm right there with you. So part of my time as a, as a veterinarian is truly being a clinician in the veterinary world. Uh, as you were saying, I'm also the co-founder of a company called VetGirl. And what VetGirl is, it's an online educational company. So we provide online continuing education. Similar to this, we do podcasts, we do webinars, blogs, how-to videos. The reason that we started doing that, myself and my business partner, Justine, Justine Lee is a double board certified critical care specialist and toxicologist is that we have a passion for teaching. We have a passion for education. But again, part of that goes back to us being with you in the trenches, in the clinical space, seeing those cases. So we want to let you know what we do, what's out there, what's new in the literature. So I split my time right now, in a sense, working eight days a week in that sort of joke setting. But, you know, uh, part of my time is a practicing clinician and part of my time is education, both uh, in the real world, lecturing at conferences and also doing uh, online sessions like what we're doing today. Yeah. And you have online uh, trainings uh, on hypotension as well, right? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think that what we do is Justine and I find topics that are clinically relevant. And uh, I think that anybody in the practicing veterinary space knows that hypotension is common. It doesn't always have to be life threatening or serious, but it's something that we likely face on an everyday basis. My guess is that is one of your concerns on every patient that goes under general anesthesia for a procedure. It doesn't have to be bad. It may mean we have to tweak a setting with our anesthesia, but it's very common. So what we do is we find common things to talk about 
and find specialists that are experts in that field, in that specific area to tell you what they do, why they do it, and what the literature or background is behind that. So hypotension, all too common for our practitioners. And and what I was thinking uh, when I, I saw your training is, um, I'm uh, I work in a, a G, uh, in GP I, as a first opinion practice, and I see a, a, a huge variety of patients, and some of them I referred on to <laughs> to more sp- uh, specialized uh, veterinarians than than I am, but. Um, I'm uh, a little afraid or I'm uh, worried to, that I would miss something important and I thought that could be maybe uh, you can help us a little uh, to to um, what to look for. I mean the the, re- the very severe cases I probably would guess they, <laughs> they they could be hypertensive and of course I can measure the blood pressure but but can you give us um, an overview of what to look out for and what not to miss? Absolutely. And I think you actually bring up a very good point in that you don't know there's hypotension unless you measure blood pressure. So the first thing is in practice, you have to have some form of equipment to measure blood pressure. Uh, Justine and I have a very similar thought process in practice. And many new graduates come up to us and they ask us what our opinion is on a practice. Should I work there or what should I be looking for? in a practice. And we have a very similar thought process in that if the practice does not have an ability to measure blood pressure, or if they don't have the ability to measure what we call a minimum database. And what I mean by a minimum database is a PCV, a total protein, a blood glucose, and you may call it something else. Different universities may call it a big three or big four or a quats or something else. But if that practice at minimum can't do those things, they may not have the ability to run full in-house blood work. They may not have ultrasound in practice. But if you cannot at minimum measure blood pressure or do that big four, maybe we're looking somewhere else because there has to be some form of standard of care. And blood pressure is a big one. If you put a patient under anesthesia, which most practices do, and I'm not talking about your sick septic or internal bleeding patient, but at minimum to do wounds, uh, lacerations, spays or neuters, Mm. splenectomies, things that most general practitioners are doing, we should have an ability to measure blood pressure. So you bring up the very good point of you have to have something in practice to measure it. So the first thing is having that piece of equipment, whether it's a Doppler, or an oscillometric device that measures blood pressure, I do feel that it's very important that a practice has some form of equipment to measure blood pressure. But then going back to the comment that you, or question you asked, what should we be looking for? Are there clues or keys to say, hmm, that patient may be one that is at risk to being hypotensive. What are examination parameters that would make me think that's possible? And this is really an important point because while we may have fancy tools and fancy equipment in practice, we are, our hands, our eyes, our training, we are very expensive pieces of equipment because as we know, it costs a lot of money to get trained as we are. And I think we have to trust our judgment before we grab that device, that blood pressure, that ultrasound, go to x-ray. We have to use our training. We are Our hands are very expensive. Our brains are very expensive. So we have to look at that patient. Number one, even before you put your hands on them, how are they interacting with you? How are they interacting with their environment, with their owners? Is it a nine-month-old puppy that should be bouncing off the walls? yet they're really sleepy and lethargic. Now, that owner may say, of course, we know babies, we know puppies and kittens. They play hard and they sleep hard. But usually when they go out of their environment, bright lights, new people, new sounds, they're usually excited. Mm. Are they just laying there very sleepy, very lethargic? So we look at them. Then we get our hands on them. What is their mucous membrane color? Is it a nice, healthy pink color or is it more pale than you expect? What is their heart rate? Many of our patients to compensate if they have low blood pressure, for example, will become tachycardic. They will have a higher than normal heart rate. Are they tachycardic? And importantly, when I escult them with my stethoscope, I feel the pulses at the same time. Number one, 
What do the pulses feel like? Are they normal, full feeling pulses or are they abnormal? And people have different words that they use to describe abnormal pulses. Examples would be thready, mm -hmm. snappy, snappy pulses. Is it something that doesn't feel like a full, in a sense, well-rounded, healthy pulse? So we're listening to the heart and we're feeling the pulse. And then secondly, not only what are the pulses feel like, but are they matching up with the heartbeats or are there dropped beats? Could there be an arrhythmia? So that's why I don't listen to the heart and then independently feel the pulses. I do it at the same time. And you feel the pulse in the, the femoral artery, right? Interesting. Great question. My first thought is, yes, the femoral artery. Now, some of us will also feel the back foot, the dorsal pedal artery. Mm -hmm. That you have to have even a better blood pressure to feel. As you start becoming hypotensive, you may lose that first, but you're absolutely right. My first thought as I'm escolting them is to take my other hand and feel the femoral pulse because of its common nature Often it's great accessibility and it usually doesn't bother the patient. So yes, absolutely. The the femoral pulse is what I feel while I'm escolting that patient. Yeah. And, and it might be obvious, but the heartbeat and the pulse is not always the same, right? It, it may not be, especially in your sicker patients or if they have the arrhythmia. Sometimes there's a very slight lag between the two, but you want them to match up pretty closely as you're hearing them. If not, then I may grab another piece of equipment, for example, an EKG to feel or see if I'm missing something. Yeah. But absolutely, I want to make sure that it's a good, strong feeling pulse and also matches up with the heart rate. Mm -hmm. And and sorry, I interrupted you there, uh, but uh, that was lethargic and the, the pale mucous membranes and sure, the, so the pulse and heartbeat. Absolutely. So again, if they're more lethargic than you would expect, not active as you would expect, if you look at their mucous membranes and they're more pale than you would expect, that would indicate abnormalities like poor circulation, hypotension, anemia. Now, we can't make a definitive on that, but we're just talking about keys or clues to decide Is there something going on and this is not a normal patient? If they're tachycardic, usually hypotensive patients are not bradycardic. With that said, I always joke that cats are illiterate. They can't read. <laughs> they never read the textbook. So a bradycardic cat, I would say, also could be a sick hypotensive patient. But uh, while I don't want to use the words always or never, dogs that are hypotensive or more likely to be tachycardic. So if they have an abnormal heart rate and if the pulses don't feel as they normally should, a nice, strong, healthy pulse, those are all indications for me to say, hmm, maybe there's something going on. Should we check a blood pressure in this patient versus your happy, healthy dog that comes in for your routine appointment, your well check? You're not going to take that dog that's doing well and say, before my vaccines, before my healthy well check, I should check their blood pressure just to be safe because mm -hmm. everything else should feel and should look fairly normal. Yeah. And and when we go to the doctors and here in Denmark anyways, uh, blood, pr blood pressure is pretty much uh, standard uh, even for a, a, a fairly young guy as, as, uh, as I am. <laughs> they would usually also just check the, uh, the blood pressure just because it's, uh, it's easy and I can sit still long enough for them to measure it. Interestingly enough, I totally agree with you. When every time I go to my doctor, my physician, they check my blood pressure. With that said, you and I and people in general get different diseases than what our dogs do. For example, arteriosclerosis, so hardening of the vessels, high cholesterol. I mean, these days it's pretty hard to find somebody that isn't on some sort of statin for high cholesterol as they reach a certain age. Those types of issues aren't normally seen. Now, there are certainly indications in older patients to check blood pressure, but usually those are more related to hypertension or high blood pressure as compared to hypotension. So many of the times that you and I are checked, we're going in for our healthy well check, whatever we're going in for our, our yearly exam. And, and it, if an older cat comes in with kidney disease, usually the clinician, usually the physician is more checking to say, hmm, could there be hypertension, not so much hypotension that they're worried about? Yeah. And and so uh, to get a, a feel for when it's uh, um, um, 
uh, relevant to, to measure blood pressure. Uh, I have an example actually from today. I had a corky in. That was a, a walk-in. So it was um, semi-acute, uh, semi-emergency because uh, she didn't have an appointment that morning, but she wanted uh, the dog checked uh, the same afternoon. And it's been, uh, it had a, a PUPD for a couple of days and uh, a little bit of loose stools. That, uh, that was basically it. Um, and the the membrane, the mucous membranes were just sort of yellowish, not not yellow, but sort of not completely <laughs> red. And uh, the capillary fill time was just about uh, two seconds, and the femoral pulse was there, but not as uh, as uh, fast as or um, as hot as it needed to be. Would that be a patient for measuring blood pressure? You think? From what you describe, absolutely. You know, when you comment about polyuria and polydipsia, increased thirst and increased urination, it's really hard in some of these patients to decide quantitatively when the owners bring them in, how much water are they really drinking and how much are they really urinating? And I do think as far as loss of fluid, urinary loss is one that we see fairly commonly. And so those patients, cats or dog, may actually be losing a fair volume of fluid through their urinary tract. The owners don't quantitate well. They drank 60 mils out of their bowl. They don't have a urinary catheter in. So what if they're drinking 60 mils but putting out 120 mils over and over and over? Eventually, that patient will become not only dehydrated, a loss of intra- excuse me, a loss of interstitial volume, but they will eventually become hypovolemic, a loss of intravascular volume. So I completely agree with what you're describing. It's very reasonable to check a blood pressure because not great pulses, not great mucous membrane color or you know, good responsive capillary refill time, that patient may be hypotensive or borderline hypotensive where we know fluid therapy is indicated. Yeah. And obviously, a, a blood sample uh, would also be a, a, a fair way to to go, of course. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just to uh, point out that uh, one test cannot stand alone here. A hundred percent agree. And this is where I think our eyes, our hands as clinicians, as practitioners are very important. That's going to give you an amazing overall global assessment of the patient. You can't just take one test. You couldn't, for example, take an x-ray and make your entire clinical decision based on that. You can take a blood pressure and make your entire clinical decision. If I made maybe not the best example, but what happens if you have a patient that comes in in heart failure? And as a result of heart failure, with many things going on, they are hypotensive. If you didn't ascult that patient, if you didn't listen and look at that patient, but just decided you were going to check a blood pressure and the Doppler gave you, let's say, a systolic of 70. If you did not look at the patient, you may say, well, they're hypotensive. Let's give them a fluid bolus. Where clearly, if that patient is in heart failure, congestive heart failure, we know a fluid bolus is not indicated. So maybe not the best example, but just agreeing with you completely that one test alone cannot give you the complete clinical picture. And that's where we, with our minds, with our brains, with our studies, must put all of these tiny pieces of the puzzle together to get to that end product of differentials and therapy as a result. Mm -hmm. Um, and this uh, might be too general a question, but you, maybe you can help us out on on the therapy here because you you mentioned a bolus, uh, so it it's uh, of course more complicated than just pulling some saline out of the the cupboard and then uh, pour it in. As but can you give us um, some hints on on where to start? Absolutely, and I think if we take it one step back, what I try to do when I'm practicing is before I get into differentials and treatment, I try to make really big, broad categories. So I try to, for example, and not talking about hypotension specifically, but sometimes anemia, a low red blood cell count can be challenging for the clinician. What's causing it? What do I do? How do I make this better? Well, try to keep things simple. So if we're talking about anemia, I would say, well, there's three reasons why you have a low red blood cell count. Either we're losing them somewhere, so we're bleeding internally or externally, we're destroying them, for example, immune-mediated disease, or we're not making red blood cells. As simple as it gets, 
those are the three processes. So if I can help try to shrink down that process, can I rule any of those in or out? My differential list gets easier and my treatment options get easier. If I'm talking about hypovolemia, what are categories of hypovolemia? Now, sometimes it's very easy for you. If you have a patient under anesthesia, maybe it's decreased vascular tone. If you have a patient that's internally bleeding, maybe it's loss of intravascular volume. But again, if we make it big, broad categories, what are options? Well, one of them I would say is decreased preload. So for example, what would be options of decreased preload to the heart? Well, if you have hypovolemia, so if you have a patient that is bleeding, hemorrhaging, either they were hit by a car and they're bleeding on the floor, or they're a hemoperitoneum, a hemoabdomen with a splenic mass that's bleeding internally, so hemorrhage. Gastrointestinal losses, so the patient that has severe vomiting or diarrhea. Think about your young parvovirus puppy or your hemorrhagic gastroenteritis patient that just has a ton of vomiting and diarrhea. Going back to the comment or example you gave, severe polyuria, so urinary tract losses. Mm -hmm. If they have severe third spacing, so effusions, a big abdominal effusion, uh, burns, so patients that are in house fires that have burns, they're losing lots of fluids or heat stroke for that matter. So those would be hypovolemia causes of a decreased preload. Then you can also have a decreased venous return. So a very common thought in my head about decreased venous return is your pericardial effusion. So your dogs with a heart-based tumor or your right auricular or right atrial hemangiosarcoma that develop pericardial effusion. So they have decreased venous return to the heart. For another heart example would be a restrictive pericarditis. Other options for decreased venous return would be a severe pneumothorax. Or if they're under anesthesia or on a ventilator and you're giving lots of positive pressure ventilation, positive pressure in the chest decreases venous return to the heart. A really common other example would be a GDV, a gastric dilatation and volvulus. It's not that they don't have the volume in their body. It's just not getting back up to the heart, so decreased venous return. So going back to that general concept, decreased preload, either as a result of hypovolemia or decreased venous return. Another completely separate category would be a decreased heart function, decreased cardiac function, so any type of cardiomyopathy, valvular disease, any type of arrhythmia, bradyarrhythmia or tachyarrhythmia. I would say in veterinary medicine, tachyarrhythmias are a lot more common. We see dogs in ventricular tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia. If your heart is beating so fast, what's happening is that you're not allowing diastole and relaxation to get that fluid back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes electrolyte abnormalities can do it. Changes in potassium, changes in calcium, or severe acid-base disturbances. One that comes to mind most commonly would be a severe metabolic acidosis. Mm -hmm. We can see that as well. So that's decreased cardiac function. So now we have decreased preload and decreased cardiac function with the final then category I would put on there of a vascular tone problem, so decreased vascular tone. Examples would be sepsis or SIRS, anaphylaxis, certain drugs. So let's go back to our anesthesia. So patients under inhalant anesthesia, if they're on beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, we can also see vascular tone problems from, as well, electrolyte abnormalities, acid-base abnormalities, or even severe hypoxia. So I'll try to put hypo, me, hypotension in one of those three categories, because then in going back to your question, trying not to be too long-winded, but when you say therapy, what are we going to do? I have to first decide what therapy I'm going to use based on what cause it is, because going back to my example of the heart failure patient, fluid therapy is not going to be indicated. In fact, that's contraindicated. So if I look at that patient and say, they have a cardiomyopathy, they're in heart failure, giving them a bolus of saline is not a recommendation. In fact, that is contraindicated to do so. Whereas if it's hypovolemia, 
or decreased vascular tone, yes, fluid therapy is going to be the mainstay of therapy for those hypotensive patients. So if you can say, let me take a deep breath, let me think that let me think about this before I just grab something. All right, do I think this patient has a heart problem or do I think it's not a heart problem? That's going to be a good indication of do I grab that bag of fluids or do I not grab that bag of fluids? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, where I would start with therapy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just one that uh, we've been struggling with here in the podcast as well is Addison's crisis. I don't know if what it's called in English, but that's the, the, the Danish term anyway, uh, or translated directly. <laughs> Same uh, term here. Okay, good. <laughs> and uh, uh, where does that one fit in, just uh, to point that specific one out? So I would put that, it depends, either in a vascular tone or a hypovolemia. If, if you had me say, well, you can only pick one, don't hedge back and forth, I usually put that more towards the hypovolemia. And the reason I do that is many of those patients come in in the Addisonian crisis state with severe GI losses. Mm -hmm. They may also have urinary losses, but usually it's a fluid volume problem that we see in my experience. Regardless, yeah. if we decide, well, they have electrolyte abnormalities and acid-based disturbances as well. Could it be a vascular tone problem? Maybe. Mm -hmm. But the point being and try to keeping the conversation simplistic is that it's not a heart problem. So we know for those patients, those Addisonian crisis patients, they typically do need fluid therapy. Yeah. And that is my mainstay of therapy. People would say, well, If it's an Addisonian crisis patient, shouldn't we be giving them what they're missing, steroids? Mm -hmm. And the answer is eventually, but that's not what's going to save them right now. Fluids are going to be my primary objective for that Addisonian crisis patient, not steroids. Yeah. Uh, and you have to be fairly aggressive with them as well, right? Interestingly enough, you do. So we're bolusing them. So typically our Addisonian patients are going to be dogs. It's it's very, very uncommon for a cat to have this issue. So we'll focus on our dog, our canine patients. What do I do for those? If we put the conversation in a bubble of a dog that is likely middle-aged, that likely does not have heart disease, because of course it's always a good question, what type of fluid do you give a dog that always, that excuse me, that has Uh, concurrent heart disease. So let's pretend like it's a dog that has a normal heart. It is a six-year-old female spade standard poodle, your textbook classic Addisonian patient that does not have a heart murmur. What would I do? I'm going to give that patient a bolus of a crystalloid fluid and very specifically an isotonic crystalloid. And by isotonic, I mean something that has a similar osmolarity to the patient, which we're talking about options such as lactated ringer solution, sodium chloride, plasma light, normal sol R. And people often ask, well, you know, the textbook says we should be giving saline or we shouldn't be giving saline. And there's a lot of conflicting discussion out there. Even though I'm a critical care specialist and we focus on the very nitty gritty of things, I will still tell you whatever isotonic crystalloid you have on your shelf is fine. Don't get too caught up in the sodium level of that specific bag. In an ideal world, sure, I'm probably picking something like 0.9% saline. But if I have plasma light because saline goes on back order or I have LRS because that goes on, something else goes on back order, no problem. Pick your isotonic crystalloid. The volume I administer is going to be a shock bolus. The shock bolus I'm going to give is 30, 30, 30, 30 mils per kg. Why 30? Well, Where does the shock volume get derived from? And the shock volume get derived gets derived from the patient's blood volume. And in a dog, it's estimated to be 90, 90, 90 mils per kg. With that said, we do not typically give the entire blood or shock volume to the dog in an isotonic crystalloid form. We give a smaller aliquot of that, usually around a third, so 30 mils per kg, and then reassess. People ask me, How rapidly do you give that bolus? 
by definition, it's as fast as you can get it in. <laughs> That's going to be dependent on the patient, though. If we think about all those fun physiology things we learned in veterinary school, some of it actually makes sense that we needed to learn that. And really, what it relies on is the catheter that you have in. So if you think about when you put a straw in your drink to drink out of that, the longer that straw is and the skinnier that straw is, the harder you have to suck to get up your, your soda, your pop, your coffee, whatever that is. If you have a very short or wider straw, if you're drinking a frozen beverage of some sort, that comes up a lot easier. So that's why all of the textbooks, when you're talking about GDV or gastric dilatation and volvius, tell you to place a short length large bore catheter because the shorter the catheter is and the larger its width or diameter is the faster fluid can go in now if you have a small patient that you have a 24 gauge catheter in you know it's very hard to bolus that patient fluid so mm -hmm. In this case, again, getting back to the point, how quickly can you bolus it in? As fast as the patient and the catheter will allow you to do it. Whenever I'm training veterinary students, I try to trick them. I give them a bag of fluids for a patient and I tell them to give that liter of fluids over 15 minutes and set up the pump to do so. Yeah. Now, if you're if you're if you're a pumps or anything like our pumps, the fastest you can give a liter is nine 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 over an hour. They can't do it, and they get all confused. <laughs> they can't give it any faster and the than mine. That. Won't go any higher than that. Exactly. Yeah. So I tell and my standard answer when nurses ask me how quickly should I give this is fifteen minutes because if I say as fast as you want and they look at me and laugh at me and say well you tell me you're the doctor how fast do you want to go in so i usually tell them 15 minutes so i'll tell them to give the fluid bolus over 15 minutes and reassess now the better question is what do i mean by reassess mm -hmm. well going back to the example of the patient you were giving me if their mucous membrane color was a little more pale than you would expect did that improve is it a healthier pink color was their capillary refill time two to two and a half seconds, and now it's a little better one and a half to two seconds? Were they tachycardic, and now is their heart rate more normal? When we were feeling their pulses, were they snappy or thready or we'll just say abnormal, and now do they feel stronger and more full? So we're going to decide, did our fluid bolus resolve those issues? If not, we decide what do we do next? Was it a little bit? Did we get a little bit of an improvement? And maybe I need to give, instead of 30 mils per kg, maybe I give 15 mils per kg and then reassess again. So we decide, did we get them out of shock? Because that's why they're in shock, getting a shock bolus. If not, what else do we do? Mm -hmm. So that's what I would do for my Addisonian patient is I would give them 30 mils per kg of an isotonic crystalloid and reassess. Did I improve their shock condition and now can i put them on more of a maintenance regular fluid rate of some sort or do they need another bolus yeah and the reason why i, I, I asked that question or I asked about the addisonian crisis is because it, um, i think most of us will uh, do pretty fine with my corky and we just put something in and and uh, with a little bit of luck we will probably end up where we we are supposed to be and these type of patients uh, with the, the addisonian crisis and the some of the others we have to be fairly quick and we have to do make some quick decisions and then just saying 15 minutes might actually help just to have an answer prepared um so yeah that was uh, very good thank you yeah, you'd be surprised how quickly these patients feel better once they get fluids on board. You know, after we have the flu or a virus and we have our own gastrointestinal signs, as fun as that is to talk about, you know how much better you feel once you're able to start taking in liquids. Mm -hmm. And these patients as well, you'd be surprised even on, if we take a different case, your internal bleeding patient, they come in, they're they're recumbent. They won't even get up. Their parents are worried that they're going to pass away before they get to the veterinary hospital. I'll give them a liter of fluids of some sort. And by the, by the time the owners come back to visit, they're standing up and walking around and the family can't believe, even though the condition is serious, how much better they look and they feel mm. with better perfusion, with better fluid on board, better fluid therapy. 
Um, just uh, one small question uh, on regards to this. Um, how about the, the body temperature? Do you use that for measuring um, fluid therapy? Great question. And everything that you and I are talking about right now, even blood pressure, if we take a step back, really what we're trying to do is get an indirect measurement or I should probably use a different word, an indirect assessment of perfusion. That's really what we're trying to do when we do things like look at the mucous membrane color, feel the pulses, take a blood pressure, take a body temperature. We're really trying to decide, is that patient perfusing? Now, nothing is perfect. We're really not measuring perfusion in a direct way at all. We're using all of these tools as an indirect way to assess that. Blood, pres blood pressure is a great option. Temperature is also a pretty good option as well. With that said, remember that patients may have different body temperatures for various different reasons, despite perfusion being appropriate, despite blood pressure being appropriate. We know that patients are going to preferentially perfuse body systems, body organs that are their better organs. If you have a patient that is hypotensive, sure, they're likely going to preferentially perfuse their heart, their kidneys, their brain, their rectum is likely not the biggest form of concern at that point. You can have patients though that technically have a normal blood pressure that also are hypotensive. So it's not something that, like we were talking about before, can be used as a single sole thing to say yes or no. You cannot draw a line in the sand to make one comment based on body temperature, but I do think, which is why body temperature should be taken on every patient, it's one of those very small pieces of the puzzle that helps the clinician make an informed decision and put together a thought process. Because we know with various conditions, whether it's our urethral obstructions or heart failures, that there are studies out there showing that they can have different temperatures with that condition that mean other things. Yeah. So yes, important, a piece of the puzzle. I would preferentially want blood pressure over body temperature, but I think it's one piece of the puzzle for our sick patients. Good. All right. Thank you. And then... Uh, Then we uh, got a little around the, the isotonic fluids. How about the plasma expanders and maybe blood products? Uh, do they come into play here in uh, regards to hypertension? Tension? Great question. So outside of your isotonic crystalloid fluids, there are two others that we can consider. Now, yes, there are hypotonic fluids. So for example, D5W or 0.45% sodium chloride, those should never be bolused in any patient. That's not something we're going to be doing. So we're going to then talk a little bit more about two options. One is hypertonic saline and the other is uh, synthetic or natural colloids. Talking about hypertonic saline, I think that is a very reasonable option to consider. Small volume resuscitation is the category of fluid I would put that in. Depending on your source of how you obtain this, sodium chloride can be purchased in approximately a 21% solution or approximately a 7% solution. I think it's actually 23.4% or about a 7.5% solution on the shelf. The 23.4% solution is not something that we should be given by a peripheral vein. It's way too hyperosmotic and hypertonic and can cause significant phlebitis. So if we are going to use hypertonic saline, it's something that should be given approximately at the 7% solution. And we do that often on patients that do need low volume, small volume resuscitation. There are some patients that truthfully are way too large. If you have your 75 kilogram large breed dog, if you take your 75 kilogram large breed dog, just say 70 to make it easy on math and 30 mils per kg, we're talking about over two liters of a isotonic crystalloid. And if they're in crisis mode, that's very hard to administer rapidly fast enough to make them better. So sometimes a hypertonic solution can be easier to give. The dose, the volume, is somewhere in the range of five mils per kg. So instead of giving approximately two, 2.1 liters to that patient, now we're giving, I don't know, five times 
70 is 200 mils, 300 mils or so, something along that line. Much easier to do that in a rapid fashion. Now, while we can give a list of contraindications that I'm sure you can all look up, the two that I would easily think about, number one, is if that patient is dehydrated. Now, it may seem like semantics, dehydration and hypovolemia, but dehydration is a loss of interstitial volume. Hypovolemia is a loss of intravascular volume. In these patients, where we're using hyperertonic solutions, the goal is to pull fluid from the interstitial space to the intravascular space. Now, if your interstitial space is depleted, aka if you're dehydrated, that's not going to work. There's nothing to pull from. So it has to be given to a patient that is normal, has normal hydration. An example, your internal bleeding 10-year-old golden retriever. That dog was running around, was active, was playful, was eating and drinking, and the splenic mass ruptured. That patient will have a loss of intravascular volume, but its interstitial space should be totally fine. Mm -hmm. So a good option, but you can't give it to a patient which is dehydrated. The other major contraindication would be a hypernatremic patient. If their sodium is already elevated, you don't want to make it any more elevated. So those were the two that I would consider. And there certainly are special indications where that may be a benefit to give hypertonic saline. One that immediately comes to mind is your hypotensive head trauma patient. So the dog that was out playing ran into the middle of the street and was hit by a car. You could argue that mannitol would be an option, but now you have bang for your buck, two birds, one stone. You give hypertonic saline, which will pull fluid out of the brain, decrease your intracranial pressure. Oh, and by the way, if because they had a normal interstitial space, you will also improve their systemic blood pressure. So hypertonic saline, a great option for subsets of patients like that. Mm -hmm. So good options. But you have to remember, it is a crystalloid. Like any other crystalloid, isotonic and hypertonic, <clears throat> excuse me, within about a half an hour period of time, 75% of that will leach out of the intravascular space back into the interstitial space. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's not going to last there forever. You're going to get a short period of time where that will be helpful. Now, some people, excuse me, while I get a sip of, sip of soda, some people will use what I call turbo starch. So what turbo starch is, is a combination of your hypertonic solution and a synthetic colloid in the same syringe for the same bolus. The mentality, the thought, the goal behind that is as you give it, the hypertonic saline will pull fluid in from the interstitial space to the intravascular space, and now your colloid, your synthetic colloid, is more likely to keep it there for a little bit longer. Then moving into your colloids, we talked about having natural colloids and synthetic colloids. And this is where we get into a little bit of a, a can of worms. If you've been following the literature for the past few years, there is a little bit of a concern right now about the use of synthetic colloids in both human and veterinary medicine. Like much of our information that we get, the concern with synthetic colloid ends up being a kidney problem, kidney disease. And it goes back in people to the use of synthetic colloids in cardiac bypass patients where they developed kidney injury as a result. And some literature is a little bit conflicting right now in veterinary medicine. Does giving a synthetic colloid cause kidney problems, exacerbate kidney problems, have no effect at all? I think we're, the jury is still out. Mm -hmm. The jury is still out. If my personal opinion is Yes, I still use synthetic colloids in practice. And by synthetic colloids, I'm talking about products such as Heta starch or Vet starch. Those are the two big ones that we currently use, with Vet starch being a little bit more common based on what my hospital and many hospitals carry right now. And the goal of doing that essentially is to increase your oncotic pressure, otherwise known as your colloid osmotic pressure. 
the thought is really it doesn't so much pull fluid in as more of keep it there. It does have a little bit of an osmotic force, but certainly not as much as your hypertonic solution. But like your hypertonic solution, it is more of a low volume resuscitation. So instead of, again, a 30 mil per kg isotonic crystalloid bolus, you're giving something more to the effect of a 5 to 10 in your canine patient, 5 to 10 mil per kg bolus for those patients. We don't really bolus so much your natural colloids. While I'm talking about a natural colloid, I'm referring to, for example, plasma. Your fresh frozen plasma or your frozen plasma, number one, cost. Those are very expensive products. Number two is their oncotic pressure is essentially the normal oncotic pressure of a patient. You're talking somewhere in the 18 to 24 range, whereas your synthetic colloids are, if I made a general comment, maybe double that. So giving a bolus of plasma is not gonna dramatically increase your oncotic pressure. I'm not saying don't bolus plasma. Now the, the textbooks would tell you not to, but if I had a dying uh, coagulopathic patient that is as brain hemorrhage, yeah. yes, I mean, of course, there's always those abnormal cases, but by definition, we normally don't bolus our natural colloids. Good. So uh, if quite quickly here, uh, things get uh, a little bit more complicated and you would have to uh, know what you, uh, yeah, of course, you know, you would have to know what you're doing, but uh, it's not as uh, straightforward as uh, the, the basic crystalloids. I would say it's usually not most clinicians' first choice to bolus something hypertonic or a colloid, and that's for a variety of reasons. Number one is synthetic colloids are inexpensive, they're readily available, and I think for most practitioners, most clinicians, you're comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. You use them day in and day out, and truthfully, nine times out of ten, they're going to be your first choice anyway. But you do get into some situations where if you had more than one thing on your shelf, again, going back to our 75-kilogram large breed dog, would a hypertonic solution be a reasonable option? In some of those cases, low-volume resuscitation may get you to your end point faster. But yes, Isotonic regular crystalloids are going to be your first choice nine times out of ten, if not nine point nine times out of ten in your in general practice and the emergency setting alike. Yeah, and uh, for a, a vet like me and GP, I uh, I would uh, be pretty safe to just put some crystalloids uh, on it and try to stabilize the patient before sending it off to a, a colleague like you that could um, be more specific in, in the therapy maybe. Absolutely. And I think that is something that is an, ex an extremely important part of the referral process. It's stabilizing a patient so they do survive to get to that second point. So fluid therapy for many of these patients ends up being something that is life-saving. They come to the general practitioner, they are hypovolemic, hypotensive, if they did not get that fluid bolus, for example, they may not have survived even transport to get to that second facility. Mm, yeah. And of course, obviously, we could talk uh, a lot more on, on this topic. Uh, but um, uh, if people would like to know more and like to learn more, and you have this online training on hypotension, but you have a ton of other courses. Um, so maybe we should talk about those just for a couple of minutes. So uh, how is it done on VetGirl and how, how do I get them smarter with your help? <laughs> well, hopefully it's very easy. The simplest way is probably just to Google all one word VetGirl, but the website is vetgirlontherun.com. And the on the run part is that we know that Veterinary practitioners have what we call time poverty, meaning we're always busy. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're always learning when we're on the run, when we're on the go from point A to point B is really the, the impetus. One of the goals of us providing this education is because we want to make sure the busy veterinary practitioner can learn on their time. So on our website, uh, one of the main ways people learn is through webinars. And so our webinars are given live. We'll have a specialist in that field. As, as we were talking about, I'm a critical care doctor. 
doctor, an ER doctor, I'm not going to be talking about the principles of surgery or anesthesia. We'll find an anesthesia specialist, an anesthesiologist to talk about anesthesia principles. We'll find an ophthalmologist and so on and so forth. And so you can log on and watch our webinars. They're live. You can ask questions. But because we know, again, practitioners have time poverty, if you are a member of ours and you could not attend live, all of our content goes into our on-demand library. So you can go back anytime, whether it's two in the afternoon or two in the morning and watch that content. So it's convenient for you to do so. So we'll do webinars. We'll do podcasts like we're talking about now. We'll do videos, how-to videos, how to do a thoracocentesis, a chest tab, how to unblock a cat, how to do a bone marrow. So we'll do how-to videos, and we have really multimedia learning. So however you learn, whether it's listening, watching, observing, we have a multimedia approach to learning. So hopefully all, all practitioners can learn on their time and in, in the way that benefits them most. Yeah, and you can go in and take the uh, the courses that you like, and maybe get out, and then come back here when you have a little more time, and just pick and choose uh, whatever topic you like, right? Absolutely, because we have really a whole approach. We do. Anything you can think of, we have content on uh, soft tissue surgery, dermatology, anesthesia, really uh, behavior, and we even have some business management, some uh, social skills, some compassion fatigue. So we try to think about all the different uh, things that veterinary practitioners face on a daily basis. Some are medical and some are non-medical. So we want to make sure that we're giving you all the content that you need. And our members, many of the things that we've done are because our members have said, hey, have you ever thought about giving a webinar on this topic? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So we'll find a speaker to do that topic and we'll We'll set it up. So much of our content is because the general practitioner, our member, has said we want a topic on this, and we get that done. Yeah, and uh, the the website would that be the the best way to get in contact with you, or is there anywhere else you'd like to mention as well? No, that website would be the best. Uh, I won't even give out my email because sometimes people forget. But even on the website in the top corner is the contact button. If you write a note using that contact button, it comes to me anyway. And I'm happy to respond or answer any questions and give you any information you need about Vecoral or hypotension or mm -hmm. anything else that we can help with. Okay, thank you very much, Garrett, for coming on here and sh sharing a bit of your knowledge and your enthusiasm and uh, uh, your time, of course. So thank you very much. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Fik du ikke det hele med, så kig over på hjemmesiden på sivp.dk-94. Der er links og noter fra dagens afsnit. Vi høres ved. Tak for i dag.